Good morning, everybody. My name is Alex Colvin, and I am the Public Programs Curator here at the Archives, but today I get the honor to be the moderator for our sessions of amazing speakers. And so I'm going to start off by introducing our very first speaker, Dr. Catherine H. Brond. Dr. Brond is the Hallfield Professor of Southern History at Auburn University. Her research focuses on the ethno-history of the Creek and Seminole Indians in the 18th and early 19th century, particularly early trade and exploration and the environment of the Deep South interior. She's the co-author with Gregory Wasselkoff of William Bartram on the Southeastern Indians and Fields of Visions, Essays on the Travels of William Bartram, which she co-edited with Charlotte M. Porter. Her latest book, co-authored with archaeologists Greg Wasselkoff and Raven Christopher, who's also in the audience today, uh, is called The Old Federal Road in Alabama, An Illustrated Guide, and that is for sale in the museum store. Today would be a great day to get it because you have two authors here who I'm sure would be willing to sign it for you. So she served as president as the Bartram, of the Bartram Trail Conference for 10 years and continues to serve as a member of the board and she would like me to say that she would invite all of you to engage in a more active role in the concert in the conference. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Catherine Braun. Thank you, Alex, and uh, thank you all for coming. And I especially want to thank uh, Steve Murray and his fantastic staff. Steve, you've really rolled out the red carpet, and we all really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Well, I am here uh, to, to talk about uh, William Bartram's journey among the Creeks, uh, a, a topic about which I probably could ramble on at length, so I'm going to try to be brief and concise, and if, if I run over time, I think Dr. Colvin will wave a towel at me or something, so I'm, I'm all ready for that. Uh, Bartram is, is mainly, uh, when, I, when I started studying him, was mainly regarded as the botanical explorer, Bartram's green world, plants, 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 and I love plants as much as anyone, but for me, Bartram really doesn't get the credit he deserves for being an observer, a participant observer, and scholar of the South Eastern Indians. And when you look at the body of his writings, it's really amazing how much they concentrate on the Native Americans that he uh, visited with and he actively quizzed people about. So he's not only observer, but he was an information gatherer. And up here I've just given a list of some of the some of his writings, or most of them I should say. Uh, his, his manuscript report back to Father Gill contains some information. The travels narrative, you know, it's three parts. The first three parts are that, you know, here's where I went and and so forth. But part four is its own special part, written in a different style, specifically devoted to a discussion of the customs and manners of the Southeastern Indians. It's a book in itself. And then, later on, because he was quizzed by many people in and out of uh, around Philadelphia and in the uh, New American government, he actually uh, wrote a series, he answered a series of questions posed to him, the most famous of which uh, was finally published in 1853 under the title Observations on the Creek and Cherokee Indians. Uh, even before that, a manuscript which was not published until uh, the, uh, the book that Greg and I edited was a little document called Some Hints and Observations Concerning the Civilization of the Indians or Aborigines of America. It was a position paper to the George Washington government. So he was not only influ influential as an observer, but he helped shape America's first Indian policy. And there are various manuscript letters that he wrote. So his work really is a treasure trove for ethno-historians who study uh, the Creek Indians. So we know um, about his writings. Uh, they're all available in various edited forms, many of them for sale on the auction table, and I encourage you to uh, check them out there and also on the press uh, tables out there. Uh, so we know about where he went, and this is, uh, many of you probably will not recognize this until I tell you this, but if you want a copy of Francis Harper's Travels and you flip to the back, the map that Francis Harper included with his travels was based on a, a manuscript map from the 18th century known as the Stuart Gage map. John Stuart was the superintendent of Indian Affairs. Thomas Gage was the commander-in-chief of British forces in North America. And Stuart uh, sent his uh, people out 
to get a really good map of his department, the Southern Department. It's uh, now in the Clements Library. It's all uh, tattered and falling to pieces. And uh, But uh, what the archives did when they did the exhibit was to try to recreate that on a wall map that you could actually see. So when you go up to the museum this afternoon, you'll be able to see the trade paths marked by that map. And it was it's a very accurate map for its time. And uh, kind of follow and understand where Bartram went. I know that's too small to see, but look for this thing. It's big, it's on the wall, you can't miss it. Um, this is the, the manuscript of that uh, map. And um, again, I know it's hard to see, but you can see here the Chattahoochee and the trade path coming this way. And here's Bartram's route, um, and you even see on this map uh, James Germany, and I'm going to speak about him a little bit. So that's where Bartram went. He came across the Chattahoochee, uh, down around the bottom of the Tallapoosa River on the trade paths, and then he went uh, down to Mobile, all the way to the Mississippi, and then back up again. So that's kind of where he went. Uh, and here are the dates, and I know it's, it's hard to read all this, but he didn't stay very long. This is uh, 1775, July 11th. I'm using Tom Halleck's uh, itinerary that he worked out. He crossed the Chattahoochee and arrived at the town of, of Uchi. Uh, a couple of days later, after resting the horses, they headed for the Tallapoosa River and got to Tallahassee. And I want to uh, particularly uh, let you look at that, because I've got a, a word up there, Tate. That is David Tate. Uh, David Tate was John Stewart's deputy among the Creeks. And about the time that Bartram was arriving in the Creek Nation, David Tate had called a meeting of all the Creek headmen. They were meeting at Little Tallacy, uh, which is up here. I think you can see it up here, if I'm pointing right. Uh, Bartram is down down there, and um, he called the meeting, and he said in his official letter, and I'm going to quote here, to acquaint the Indians with the situation of affairs in the different provinces and what had befallen you. Now, the you is Stuart, John Stuart, and what had befallen John Stuart, who had actually given Bartram letters of introduction, was that John Stuart had had to leave his sick bed and flee Charleston because the revolution was kicking off and the king's men were in trouble in South Carolina. And so here you have the British agent meeting with the Creeks saying, Things are bad, the superintendents had to flee, and here comes Bartram into the Creek towns, and he is riding with George Golfin's men. And Golfin would soon, if not already, had been appointed as the representative from the, uh, from the American faction, the traitors, the rebels, to the Creeks. So this is a very tense time politically for anyone to be moving into the Creek nation. And, uh, and it explains not only, I think, Bartram's haste, uh, but his uh, circumspection in many uh, cases. And so uh, he does, uh, he's going with traders, so he travels uh, down from the, to the creek town of Atassi and Coolamy, and then he leaves for Mobile. And uh, before Bartram comes back in October, uh, the rumors are running, and uh, other things are going. He has heard that the, uh, the Spanish have taken St. Augustine, that was not true. He had uh, he reported to the British government that the Choctaw Indians had attacked a creek town. They killed a woman. They'd left war tokens. Uh, those were real. And so here you go. Is the, the American Revolution's heating up. The creeks are at war with the Choctaw Indians along those bloody fields of Scambia that Bartram mentions. And so it's a tense time. So these guys are moving up and down the trade uh, paths pretty quickly. And then, of course, uh, so Bartram leaves, and, you know, there he is at Major Farmer's Plantation, who you'll hear about, who's British, uh, but he's traveling with Americans. And so finally he arrives in the creek towns again, has to stay a bit uh, because the traders are going out as fast as they can. They're trying to get their deerskins to the port uh, because uh, non-importation agreements are kicking in. So this is, this is a bad time uh, politically and economically for people. And he finally um, then, in the beginning of 1776, leaves the Upper Creek towns and goes back across the Chattahoochee past the Lower Creek towns on in Georgia. So that's, uh, 
that's where uh, he is then. So uh, it was, as he wrote in his book, a very delightful territory, right? Uh, he didn't stay long because there was actual business to be conducted. There, there's revolutionary turmoil, and I do mean real turmoil, because not long after Bartram left, the, Ameri the, the, the Creeks who will be al aligned with the Galfin faction actually uh, put hits out send warriors off to murder Tate and Mr. Sequo, who's a leading uh, British chief and so forth. And it's really, it's really a tense time. As one of the Indian chiefs said, we like to have made a war among ourselves over the decision. Do you support the British? Do you stay with the Americans? So it's a very tense time politically in the Creek Nation. And of course, the Choctaw War is still raging. So Bartram had uh, a lot of, a lot of um, uh, uh, negative undercurrents, let's say, as he traveled through this delightful territory. And when he traveled, he was largely traveling with uh, deerskin traders. And I wanted to talk particularly about one. And I'm going to stick his uh, uh, image of a creek town up as I do this. Uh, he had many informants and helpers. And when he got to the Creek Nation, his host at the little town of uh, Kulami, uh, that last uh, town before you headed off to Mobile, was a man called James Germany. Uh, it was on the south side of the Tallapoosa, Germany's establishment was. And Bartram gives us a little bit of information about Mr. Germany, as well as the town he lived in. Bartram was there for two to three days, and he noted he carried letters for Germany, and I think these were no doubt from Golfin, telling him about the situation in Georgia and so forth. And he consulted with Germany, as Bartram put it, in matters relative to my affairs and future proceedings. Now those future proceedings were who he was going to see in the Tinsaw when he got there because Germany uh, knew Major Robert Farmer and I'm sure Germany is the one who directed him to the Farmer Plantation. In any case, I can just imagine that Germany filled his ears with a lot of good advice. Um, Germany was not the kind of rough and illiterate we think of sometimes when we think of a deerskin trader. In the 1750s and 60s, he had started out in business as a licensed trader of some note. He was respected enough by both the British and the Creeks to serve as an interpreter for them on more than one occasion. In fact, when Fort Toulouse was turned over to the British, farmer dispatched Germany with that news. The few surviving letters of his we have to officials and business partners mark him not only as literate, but a man of education, and he was very skilled in the language of diplomacy. He was also a man of means. He had applied on two different occasions for hundreds of acres of land in Georgia, and I think received at least one of those. When David Tate, the king's agent, had reached the Creek Towns in 1772, pulling into Germany's house, uh, it was Germany's slaves who were dispatched to carry over the surveyor's baggage in a canoe, and these enslaved people swam the surveyor's horses across the Tallapoosa River. And this was in February, and the river was swollen. Uh, Tate reported at that point the Tallapoosa was 200 yards wide and 20 feet deep. That's an onerous task indeed uh, to have to undertake. Um, and he had 12 of these enslaved people working for him at his plantation uh, across the river from the town of Coulomie. Bartram, as is uh, his habit, uh, did not mention these enslaved people, but did provide a concise description of Germany's family situation. Bartram tells us that Germany was an elderly gentleman, but active, cheerful, and very agreeable. He received and treated me with the utmost civility and friendship. His wife is a Creek woman, a very, worth, a very worthy character and disposition. She is industrious, prudent, and affectionate, and by whom he has several children. He is desirous to send them to Savannah or Charleston for their education, but cannot prevail on his wife to consent to it. This affair affects him very sensibly, for he has accumulated a pretty fortune by his industry and commendable conduct. Uh, affected him since... Um, uh, sensibly indeed. So let's restate what Bartram wrote in terms that Mr. Germany might have understood, I think probably did, but that Bartram didn't. Germany's property, 
Probably even those enslaved people were the property of his wife in the Creek Nation. All property was held by that woman. The household was hers. And in, in, in the kind of Creek view, that store where he had his goods and anything there, she had access to. Um, and so she and her matrilineal kin had absolute say over the upbringing of her children who were of her clan and carried her kinship, most importantly, the patrilineal line in the, in the raising of children was not important. <laughs> Uh, and I'm betting, though, that Germany did teach them to read and write uh, because he did intend that they should get his business as a trader. So Bartram saw and Bartram observed, and maybe he understood, but I don't think so. Most British men of the period did not get that little thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they just didn't get it. But those Creek women, they knew and they understood, make no mistake. This little town that Bartram visited was, by Bartram's reckoning, a beautiful town, and he was not alone in declaring the place a pleasant one. On his first tour of the Creek towns, Benjamin Hawkins would write, and this is some 20 years later, that the place was a very pretty little compact town, beautifully situated. Bartram and uh, Hawkins and Tate, they all visited what they called the new town because the town had been resituated from the high bluff on one side of the river to the low land on the other. And while he was there, Bartram described uh, the, the housing. Uh, he said they had pl the, the walls were plaster over a wood frame, a roof made from a wooden frame with sing uh, cypress shingles. And he described in detail the individual uh, households of family groupings. And later, uh, when he drew, uh, after his book had been published, he drew a series of drawings to accompany his observations on the Creek and Cherokee Indians. It's, it's this time when he was in uh, El Tasi and Kulami and went through Tuckabachi that he uh, visited and understood and described these various structures in the Creek town. And when you uh, when you look, you will see these are, these are the individual households with little fences. He describes all that and the main public structures, which you see listed here. Uh, and he did find uh, in this, this town a beautiful new square, he said. But he noted, and this is important from a historical perspective because it's true for every Creek town, that Germany's store and his plantation with those enslaved people were across the river on the opposite shore. In, he didn't say this, but what's going on is those, those noisy stores with pack horses, with dogs, with, uh, with uh, dung heap fowl and uh, horses and cattle uh, were situated away from the town proper and away from the town's cornfields. Uh, it was a source of contention between Creeks and their traders. And Bartram also, because of his visit there, understood the sacred nature of the square, which was a well-ordered arrangement of carefully delineated space that represented the spiritual cosmos of the Creek people. And Bartram didn't unpack all the various, uh, uh, he didn't understand everything about the spirituality that, uh, and, and religious conceptions of the Creek people, but he understood it enough to know that it was a sanctified space and it was regulated very strictly by custom uh, out of respect for the force of nature. And he did question those about uh, the square and its uses and so forth, as well as the lands around. And so when you read travels, you uh, understand about uh, hunting, about gathering, about subsistence activities, and particularly agriculture, both the common fields and the individual household gardens. Um, Bartram was even more specific um, as he described a very uh, incredible experience he had in a neighboring town, the town of Atasi, where he joined traders and creeks in the great council house or rotunda for ceremonial black drink. Uh, the, the, uh, the winter council house, as it was called, is where the ceremony moved in the winter. Um, he described the rotunda there as a vast conical building of circ or circular dome capable of accommodating many hundred people. 
Seldom, I think, in historic literature is it possible to find a more compelling description of an Indian ceremony than Bartram's measured cadence detailing the solemn drama of the black drink ceremony he enjoyed at Atasi. It began when two men entered the darkened rotunda, which was lit only by a fire made from a circular uh, spiral circle of dried cane bundles. Then the men serving, Bartram called them servants, uh, but they weren't, uh, proceeded to serve black drink or cassin, the famous ceremonial beverage of southeastern Indians brewed from the leaves of Alex Vomitoria, uh, the Yopan Holly. The singers, as they were called, uh, were not slaves or servants. They held a special office uh, and were very important uh, officials, and serving this tea was their um, their main job. Uh, there is a very famous singer, most of you will remember or call to mind when I give you his name, Asiola, Asiahola. He was a singer, a, a, a Cassine singer. Now, of interest to me about this description that Bartram provides, and I want you to read the whole thing, but it's very special because Bartram offers to us an inkling of how the Creek world sounded. As he watched these Yohola singers offer up black drink from conch shells, he described their advance in slow, uniform, and steady steps. Their eyes or countenance lifted up, singing very low, but very sweetly. He continued his long discussion of the ceremony, noting that once the headman took the shell to drink, the singers sing two notes, each of which continue as long as he has breath. And as long as the notes continue, so, must, so long must the person drink, or at least keep the shell to his mouth. <laughs> These two long notes are very solemn and at once strike the imagination with a religious awe to the supreme, sounding somewhat like a hoo, a hoo, a hula. Yeah, he's getting close, yahola. Bartram's account of that night, the beautiful and moving ceremony, uh, but he also uh, provides details on architecture and even interior decorations on the walls. In fact, he, he tries to describe these paintings that he saw, and they are the only extant descriptions we have of interior uh, decoration, and they are much like uh, Mississippian uh, symbology when you look at them. So I, I commend his, his works to you to read those in person. Um, and read it slowly. Uh, let Bartram take you to a place where we can only imagine today, and his writing allows us to do that. When he was on the Chattahoochee River at Apalachicola, which was the first town, uh, one of the first towns he hit when he came in, he visited an Indian he called Boston or Boston or Boson, Boatswain. Uh, his name appears spelled various ways in the record. This Greek man invited Bartram for breakfast and re represented the enormous changes, like Germany, that were taking place in Creek society. And like Germany, uh, Boston held African Americans in slavery. And like Germany, his plantation was contested by others and therefore some distance from the town. Bartram had to travel for breakfast, like some of us did today. Boston slaves served uh, Bartram excellent coffee from China dishes. Both the coffee and the China dishes represented luxury goods from afar, really the high point of the Creek consumer economy. Boston's crockery and beverages were vastly different from the brewed leaves of the Yopon holly served from a conch shell, but his home was traditional, and Bartram's time there uh, provided him uh, the uh, wonderful memory in which he was able to provide us with the only uh, drawing we have of an individual Creek's homestead and the only description we have of one, and there you see uh, a, a copy of it um, on the screen. Now, Bartram's night on the town and his exceptionally stylish breakfast were not his only striking moments among the Creeks. On his return from West Florida, he provides what is perhaps my favorite passage in travels, his account of crossing a swollen creek just before arriving uh, back to Germany's uh, or back to the Creek towns uh, after he'd visited the Mississippi River. The raft building is not only instructive but entertaining, especially Bartram's confession that, unlike his Creek companion, he kept his pants on when he was swimming the river. 
Now, Bartram may have put a sweet spin on things, but he did not lack a sense of humor. And as he put it, and I'm going to read it, I stripped off everything except my britches, for they contain matters of more value and consequence than all the rest of my property put together. <laughs> mm. Mm. He had his wallet and his iPhone there. Yeah. Besides, I did not choose to expose myself entirely naked to the alligators and serpents in crossing the flood. A delightful territory indeed, right? Bartram's companion in that instructive excitement was a young Musty Creek, and by young Musty, uh, Bartram met a young man of mixed Indian-European ancestry. Uh, musty being the English term for mestizo. The young man revealed many things about Creek life. For the boy's mother was a Choctaw slave, having been captured by the Creeks in their very long wars with that tribe, which had been going on since the 60s. His father said Bartram, using language common in the 18th century, was a half-breed between a Creek and a white man. Now, we no longer use such pejorative terms. It's perceived as pejorative to use half-breed or mixed-breed or even blood. Um, we call them bicultural today, but we'll give Bartram a pass on that because whatever we call them, these young people from mixed ethnicities and various cultural backgrounds were the part of the new reality in the Creek Nation, just as that uh, chattel slavery and, and holding African Americans in slavery was. This young man who taught Bartram how to construct a traditional raft to ferry imported goods across a swollen Alabama river was following in his father's footsteps and working as a deerskin trader. For historians, particularly this one, Bartram's account of all aspects of the deerskin trade are essential to our understanding of the commerce. He not only detailed the transportation of goods, but the goods themselves and the people who produced and consumed them. The traders were sources of information and intelligence for Bartram, and he used what he learned from them and from his own observations to craft an intricate and personal account of the Creek people. And I'll take some time here to say that in your welcome packet, uh, Alabama Heritage Magazine provided us a copy of um, an article I did on the deerskin trade, so read all about it. It starts off naturally with a Bartram. Um, now, once Bartram dried his pants, uh, he attended that young Musty's wedding at the creek town of the Makalossus. The bride was the daughter of the headman of the town and the sister of the resident British trader. In that young couple, Bartram had visual proof of the strength of kinship traditions as well as the importance of trade connections. He also saw before his eyes the mixing of cultures and destinies as a result of territorial wars and the quest for trade goods as well as the impact of these new goods and ideas on the native South. And most importantly, he described the people in detail, their clothing, their bodily decorations, their homes, and the complex world in which he lived. Bartram's descriptions and artistic depictions of Indians and their world enrich our understanding of the 18th century in a way no other sources do. His descriptions of the three elements of the Creek Town, the square ground, the Winter Council House, and the Chunky Yard are among the most detailed of the 18th century. Together with documentation and, and supported by archaeological research, Bartram's descriptions and drawings have helped the Alabama uh, Museum uh, here, the Department of uh, History, uh, produce a diorama of a Creek Town to educate young people, and you'll see it this afternoon. It's Bartram's. Um, Bartram's accounts of architectural materials and interior design and decorations are matched by equally detailed reports regarding the rituals of daily life that occurred there. Unlike other visitors, in fact, almost all other visitors to the Creek Nation in the, Creek, uh, in the 18th century, Bartram left behind accounts of his meetings with individual Creeks, the young Musty, the elder who presented him with a stone pipe, the entrepreneur whose slaves served Bartram breakfast, his work teams with individuals of every kind of situ from every kind of situation, and our understanding of the Creek people is much richer for that. His work not only helps us recreate a place, but a people, and to come to know them as real human beings with names and ambitions and situations that we can relate to. 
Both at home and abroad, Bartram's work was consulted for information on the southeastern Indians. His influence was immediate, as you can see, by 1802. Um, I love this, this, uh, this drawing. It's from uh, a Dutch um, a book on anthropology. But the, 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 um, the tattoos and so forth, uh, forget the wheat and the palm tree, but a lot of the ear deformation. Uh, it's, it's the, the guy quotes Bartram extensively, and if I can ever find someone who can uh, translate that Dutch, I can write a paper on it. But that's Bartram. 1802, they're already using him to do book illustrations. The George Washington administration in the late, in the uh, 1789, relied on his perceptions of Creek and Cherokee culture to construct an American Indian policy. The first American Indian agent, Benjamin Hawkins, did what a lot of us do. When he went on a trip, he packed a copy of Travels and took it with him and consulted it frequently while he was resident among the Creeks. Those, like you, like me, still interested in the Creeks, looked to Bartram for enlightenment and continue to benefit from his careful observations and very intimate portrait of the Creek people and their world. Thank you. <laughs>